for a few things came up for me. One is this this thing that's also been been put out more and more, which is this idea of, of COVID becoming endemic. Mm. Which when people say that, they don't actually know what the fuck they're saying because that's not what COVID is. And whatever that means is is horrifying, you know, if we even anyway that that's a whole subject we can get into but also when you were talking about this it reminded me of an essay you wrote about and you probably have spoken about it on the on death panel but it's pulling deaths from the future i think is how it was phrased right it's like when the pandemic started and as it continued there was just this sense like all the people that are dying from this we're gonna die anyway it's just it happened a little sooner because they were old or they were you know immunocompromised disabled in some form or another so they're just already expendable like it was just sort of built into the way that we were meant to think about it it's just like these people are going to die anyway so why do we have to take all these extraordinary measures to uh to insulate them from from something that's inevitable for them right it's it's it's, it really like this is what the pandemic revealed it was already of I, I, this is what i think i think for people like myself that experience a certain privilege as far as being not immunocompromised not disabled in any real way being white being all these different like intersections of privilege right there was this sort of like cracking of that in the sense of oh this is what vulnerable communities have been experiencing for a really long time and now the danger is heightened so that now we can actually look at something that I, I was insulated from for a long time, that other communities were just exposed to almost, you know, relentlessly. And um, instead of addressing that in any sort of equitable or <laughs> in, any, in any real meaningful and uh, you know way, it's it's just almost like you no, know, we're still going to continue to live in this way, um, and. I don't know if there's a real question there. It's just, you know, it's just exhausting. And I can't even imagine what it's like to be, because for me, if I got, if I got COVID and I have been, I have so far been able to avoid it. Um, you know, yeah, I, I could develop long COVID symptoms. It's possible. Um, but uh, I, I'm not immunocompromised. So it's just not going to affect me in the same way. And that that kind of vigilance that you and and others have to constantly have to just like exist in any meaningful way in in our society is, I don't even know what to say. I'm sorry. It's just. It sucks. (laughs) It's just, it sucks. Like, they kind of laugh about it, but it's. it's, I mean, I laugh about it to keep from crying. You know what I mean? Like, you've got to, because it's absurd how, how, um. I think invisibilized these things can become during mm-hmm. quote unquote normal times, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, I I think in terms of like here's here's the problem. Like even if you're privileged, right, you can still spread COVID, yeah, and absolutely. our normal ways of sort of understanding. Um, how problems affect us, right? Like tend to locate within our identities and our, you know, specific circumstances. Like, are we housed? Are we not? Mm -hmm. Do we have a job? Do we not? And it's, it really sucks because people are really used to thinking through problems that way. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem that, as you're saying, um, is not just one that is like more visible, but is one that um, because it's a respiratory pandemic, because of the transmission dynamics itself, because it's in the air, you know, we mm-hmm. can't organize with each other the same way. Yeah. You know, vulnerable people are excluded from social life in a way that they, you know, that is exponentially more um, extreme than I think it has been in recent decades. And, you know, still we're, we've got this problem where we can't get people to sort of think collectively right? That there are these sort of barriers to that too. And I think ultimately, you know, part of the problem that we're having right now where, uh, you know, recommendations are really leaving people behind and you have COVID deaths really disproportionately, you know, on not only low-income communities, but specifically communities of color, Mm -hmm. you know, and yet the Biden administration is still like happy to throw people in ICE detention. You know, we've, we've got, 
hundreds of thousands of people in prison that we could free, right? Yeah. We could stop jail cycling and we would prevent so many infections, right? And these are the kinds of decisions that we need to be talking about because COVID mm -hmm. is a population level problem. Yeah. And the problem also is that for people who kind of are in this nexus of, of privilege, right, but who don't necessarily like maybe share the political perspective that you have that would like inform why you give a shit about the margins, right? Yeah. All we have is sort of straight propaganda pumped 24 seven saying you don't need to give a shit about the margins anymore. COVID is over, it's time to move on, right? And so, yeah. you know, the as much as we're sort of seeing a uh, recognition of the fact that this is going on, we're also seeing kind of like new redoubled efforts to make it go away as a problem too, mm -hmm. because I think it's an inconvenient narrative for people um, to understand how little we actually do to provide for people who are really vulnerable and how unsafe most people actually are. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to actually talk about something. Um, I would really it'd be fascinating to hear about this, which is the Great Barrington Declaration, <laughs> because I think a lot of what we're talking about, this sort of normalization of, of like, yeah, COVID's over. You, uh, yeah, I'll just let me leave it to you if you would please describe <laughs> what this declaration is, what where it came yeah. from, and maybe how it's influencing how we're uh, collectively discussing COVID now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, it's a document, but also kind of a group of people on an open letter that came about in October 2020. And it's pretty vague. But initially, what the Great Barrington Declaration called for was to end lockdowns. And again, this is when we still actually did have something resembling, you know, some sort of economic shutdown, you had closures of non-essential businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it was October 2020, so it we're not talking massive blanketed business closures like in April, May of 2020. It's after the summer of uprisings, after you know the fall, yeah. you start to see case spread in the South, and a lot of things are actually wide the fuck open at the moment that the Great Barrington Declaration starts calling for an end to lockdowns. And so they say that lockdowns are worse than the disease, that worse than yeah. the virus, mm -hmm. and that the better way to sort of develop population level immunity is through natural infection and that we shouldn't be waiting for the vaccine rollout, but we should instead be sort of sending the young and healthy out into society to become infected, and we should be sheltering the vulnerable. Um, you know, as we say on death panel, it's like as if they pretend that all the vulnerable people in the world are off in some little bubble somewhere outside of yeah. society yeah. <laughs> and not your neighbors, partners, friends, coworkers, um, children, parents, whatever. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, there are millions of people who are vulnerable, like over 30 million people, if you're using a very narrow definition. And that doesn't even, you know, count all of the children under the age of five in the United States who still can't be vaccinated, let alone anyone else who's vulnerable for any other reason. Um, you know, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that so the Great Barrington Declaration started as this proposal to um, achieve herd immunity through natural infection and protect the people more vulnerable through something called focus protection. Mm. Now, focus protection was not a pre-existing public health strategy. This is not an idea that um, meant anything before COVID. It was, it's not still an idea that is fleshed out or has any sort of large scale scientific um, support for it. It's still really um, just sort of a a just construction and like a, a rhetorical construction that mm -hmm. originated with the Great Barrington Declaration. And it's really kind of an impossible, fallacious framing, right? The idea that we could somehow, you know, one, push everyone to get infected, mm -hmm. um, which obviously also like, even if you were quote unquote healthy, that you're not necessarily going to do fine with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a push to get everyone infected. And it was a push to sort of, stop um, anything that could get in the way of the economy. Mm -hmm. And 
these people began began to be very sort of influential. They've always claimed that they're on the fringe, but they were they're supported by the architecture of sort of libertarian think tanks. Mm. And they actually come out of the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, who, you know, early on in the pandemic, they were publishing, you know, really just kind of wild rants from their, you know, scientists and people like Scott Atlas from the Trump administration are fellows there, right? So you have really, and so these people started to be brought in by Scott Atlas into the White House to start talking to the Trump administration about implementing focus protection in the fall of 2020. And you had sort of immediate outrage because this is a eugenic bullshit and absolutely unfounded strategy with no scientific backing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The hope at the time was that with vaccines, you could maybe do something like this. Yeah. But again, this was October, November 2020. We are still waiting for even early, early interim analysis really on the vaccine efficacy to come through. So this was very much sort of, well, in theory, I guess you could do it under vaccines. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the the problem is, is that, you know, the assumptions of why that might work with vaccines were if vaccines were good at preventing transmission. Unfortunately, now we know that that is not the case unless you also have it layered NPIs, unless you also have people masking, unless you, unless you also mm -hmm. make sure that when cases are high, you do things to get cases down. The only way to protect the vulnerable is to get cases down when they're high. It's mm -hmm. to keep the hospitals from being overwhelmed. It's to, you know, make sure that we're not sending workers back to work sick because they have no sick pay, right? And yeah. they're only like one missed paycheck away from losing their, you know, whatever. It just, you don't even have to be one pay missed paycheck away from losing anything to justify this, right? Like yeah. we should not be putting so many people into the position where they feel precarious enough that they want to go to work sick right now or they feel the need to go to work sick right now. But that is ultimately kind of the decision that was made. And what's that, what that's resulting in is this, these super high levels of case spread, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that even now what we're seeing is this idea of focus protection, but with vaccines, come back into play. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is exactly what the new CDC recommendations are asserting, right? People who are healthy, go about your life, no mask. Levels of transmission and case spread in the community matter less now, according to the CDC, right? They're downplaying sort of the level of transmission and they're saying, but we're going to keep the vulnerable safe. And some of the ways they suggest keeping the vulnerable safe are vulnerable people should consult their doctor about whether or not they should mask. They should reach out to local businesses and request that those businesses open up vulnerable only hours to keep them safe. Of course, ignoring the fact that vulnerable people also work um, and are in society. And um, at the medium level, this is the one that really just made me so fucking mad. I'm sorry, like so yeah, angry. Yeah. Because at level medium, they still say, listen, if you're healthy, you can go to wherever you want, sort of out and about without a mask on. But if you're coming back inside in your own home and you share a household with someone who's vulnerable, you should mask. <laughs> and so it presents a problem for people like me who, you know, are immune compromised and don't live in little bubbles somewhere. You know, I don't live off somewhere in a little bubble. I live with someone who works in person, right? You yeah. know, and uh -huh. what happens in terms of community transmission is going to dictate whether or not he brings home an infection, you know? And the only way to prevent these high levels of infection is to fucking make a decision that we're going to try and work on bringing infection down. And that's actually just the opposite of what we've done here. And yeah. it's not that like we've made this sort of like very uh, sort of fancy ruse like with the war on terror, right? There are no WMD level lies of sort yeah. of things that don't exist. It's merely this, this sort of sociological level forced shift of saying, don't look here, sort of look here. This is what's important. This is sort of yeah. what we're gonna prioritize. And then there's this tremendous work from you know the sort of liberal media establishment in terms of sort of saying, yeah, so the vulnerable, they're vulnerable. What are we gonna do? We didn't protect them before. Why are we going to protect them now? 
But also, before, we sentenced a lot of people to an early death and said that their death was just either pulled from the future or their own fault, right? We allow companies like DuPont to dump chemicals and yeah. poison our rivers and poison, like, our communities, right? You know, the, and then we say, like, okay, well, you know, cancer, right? We're going to cure cancer. It's a, it's a population-level problem. But we're not going to do anything to regulate or beef up any of the sort of existing regulatory structures that could provide oversight for the chemical industry? No, because mm -hmm. we have different priorities. There are assumptions about whether or not these lives are valuable or not. And when we lose lives that are, you know, considered to be deaths pulled from the future to the government under our current political economy, those are lives that don't add up to as much on their balance sheet. And that's really what we're seeing going on here is that they sort of you know, consistent, historical, but and very consistent devaluation of sick, vulnerable lives and the devaluation of, you know, lives of people of color are and people who don't, you know, make a lot of money. This is built into our policy evaluation systems. This is built into how we look at how we're going to target laws. This is called the economic valuation of life. It's a whole way of trying to analyze and see if we're getting, uh, you know, like our money out of certain things. Yeah. Um, so we do things like disability adjusted life years, for example, which is mm -hmm. if you're going to sort of evaluate how, um, you know, how productive, let's say a person could be after, a surgery say to maybe like repair a herniated disc in their back mm -hmm. right we'd be looking at how many disability adjusted life years did they get back and the way we sort of determine that is by looking at an idea of what their projected total income could be over their lifetime which is automatically always lower for disabled people and people with work yeah. limiting mm -hmm. impairments right so if we're starting off from a baseline of just actuarially the United States as a rule, and not just the United States, but a lot of countries do this as well, but as a rule on our balance sheet, these deaths that are pulled from the future, right? They mean less to the government. Yeah. And so this is a matter of trying to make these deaths mean less to the population as well, mean less to the body politic. And the only way you can do that is by sort of trying to enforce the economic valuation of life across all aspects of life right now. And I think that's ultimately what's going on in terms of, you know, why we see why we see the push to keep kids in person school yeah. at all costs, right? And we see no investment on standing up infrastructure for well, what happens if they do need to go home? Right? What right. happens if we do need to close school? We weren't prepared the last time to send kids to school at home, right? We need to yeah. plan for the next time, right? Yeah. And so the fact that those investments aren't being made, that that planning isn't being made, that we are rolling things back with no plan to roll them back in if we need them, right? There's all this plan for like when we could remove masks, but there's never, there's no plans for when we might need to, you know, what's gonna happen if like suddenly, um, you know, the, an entire state basically has an outbreak in the future. Are we gonna rely on individual employers to be, you know, enforcing public health at the, you know, employee yeah. level? I mean, this is absurd. This is an absurd way to approach public health. It's absolutely antithetical yeah. to any of the ideas of sort of, you know, how disease spreads too. It's pretending yeah. it's this kind of individual token that as long as you don't touch it, you're good to go, you know? 